Hi all, and welcome to this, the second video looking at management of climate change and the last video in the climate change section of the course. Now in today's video we're going to be spending some time looking at specific measures that the UK either has taken or is proposing to take to try and tackle some of the specific consequences of climate change that we've been talking about over the past couple of videos. Now, apologies, the visuals for this one, um, as, as I've said before with videos like this, the, vid the visuals for this one aren't particularly stunning, um, not that they regularly are, but um, it is nice and straightforward um, and just lets us kind of, particularly for revision purposes or when you're trying to structure exam answers, it's just it's nice and to the point. So if we look at the different challenges, um, and now what I will say before we actually go any further is that for all of this stuff there is obviously a lot more depth to be added to all of these points and that is going to be the kind of the primary thing that you're going to want to look at going forward with this is going to be to add depth to all of these areas. So if we start looking at this, so we've got, you know, our column of challenges. So our first challenge, you know, flood risk and increased erosion. Now we're going to see an increased risk of flooding just to an increase in sea level. Uh, we're also going to see inland flooding from storms as you see an increased rates of precipitation. Uh, and these storms with the increase in severity and the increase in uh, frequency and intensity is going to lead to enhanced erosion in coastal areas and in some inland areas as well. So how do we deal with that? Now, first in coastal areas, you build sea defences to try and repel these storms. It's, it's a very, very obvious one. Sea walls uh, are, are the kind of the obvious thing that people try and build, but there are other approaches to sea defences that might be looked at as well. Uh, preserving beaches, allowing marshland to flood and abandoning sea defences, which might seem a little counterintuitive, but we'll explain in a moment, um, and, and marginally. Uh, productive agricultural areas are all on the same kind of theme and that it is looking at natural ways that you can try to limit the extent of flooding or erosion from storms. So if we've got lots and lots of beaches, the beaches will take a huge amount of the damage that storm's going to throw at them. You know, something that beaches are very, very good at, you know, they'll take the damage and it'll preserve cliffs and areas like that behind them. With uh, flooded marshlands or areas of agricultural land that are, that are marginal at best being abandoned to turn into marshland, that again forms another barrier for flooding and for this increased erosion from these storms. Uh, restricting building in coastal areas, you know, it, it can't be knocked down in a storm if you didn't get to build it in the first place, is kind of the idea there. Um, improving the efficiency of natural drainage, restrict flooding in inland areas. If you make rivers more efficient, if you artificially straighten rivers if you artificially dredge them in order to make sure that they flow at a kind of an efficient rate that is going to mean that you suffer less inland flooding um, similarly uh, tougher planning restrictions reducing the use of tarmac in urban areas uh, are both aimed at ensuring that urban areas aren't as quick to get rid of water as they might be so that we've got more rates of infiltration to reduce the rates of inland flooding Last two here are kind of obviously more to do with the monetary side of things. Increased taxation to pay for all this stuff is one of the big things. I mean, none of this sea defences, you know, building a seawall is a very, very expensive endeavour. To ensure that this can be done, you know, tax rates will need to be increased. And if you put in uh, insurance premiums, particular things, you know, like home insurance, up in coastal areas, the idea is you discourage people from moving to areas that are at risk. Um, so, so then that again also reduces the need for defences in these areas because you aren't, you don't have property that's at risk. Now, with agriculture, you know, with this, we're really just talking about the declining productivity in areas of agriculture and forestry. Um, you know, as the climate changes, these areas are are going to see the amount they can produce change. How do we how do we deal with this? Um, you know, we could ensure water uh, supply. So, as an ensure, as a no, not ensure, as every time I read this I think I've written it wrong, ensure them, but not with money, but with improved infrastructure. So by improving the infrastructure, we make sure that water can make it to areas like farmland so that it can be used for irrigation. Generally promoting responsible usage of water is something that's going to be a big deal because we will have areas where we're going to see um, a shortage in supply of water. So we need to ensure the water we do have is used responsibly. Change crop types to crop types that are less thirsty. Um, fundamentally, just make sure that the crops we're growing are maximally efficient in terms of the area, the, the climate that we are now going to grow them in. Increase studies of pesticide usage. Make sure, again, it's about increasing the efficiency of the land that we have. And along with this, increase uh, testing in soil fertility so that we can make sure that we, are, we constantly know 
what areas are struggling, and it could be because of the stuff we've talked about previously, like saltwater incursion into aquifers, um, or just you know through the increased soil erosion, through increased precipitation. And the last one, increased multi-variety cropping. So try and have farms grow more, a, a wider variety of crop, because it will protect the soil more and it will give it more uh, resilience in the face of a kind of a changing climate. Now, health is going to be a big deal. You know, every year where we have a warm summer, you'll see um, announcements on the news telling the kind of the very old and the very young to be particularly careful. Um, because you know heat stroke and in, during heat waves is, is a real threat and it's you know it kills people in the UK now and if we see the world getting warmer it's only going to become more of a prominent risk. Uh, we also need to think about you know hospitals, care homes, areas like this becoming too hot for use during summer months and we need to make sure we remember that we're talking about precipitation rates increasing for some of the year as well. Now if you marry that up with getting warmer you can see more fungal growth, damp related respiratory illnesses, things like this that we're going to need to consider. Now, how do you deal with these? You know, we look at making sure new buildings are designed to cope with these kind of things. So you use materials that will ensure you get good airflow. That you will ensure that you're not going to see these fungal growths. Um, you have passive. I'm skipping one here because it's on the same theme. Uh, passive temperature control. So rather than just putting loads of air conditioning in a building, which is going to increase fossil fuel usage or increase energy usage, whether it's fossil fuel or not. You try and ensure that you know, you've got good windows and things like that to make sure that you can control the temperature in a building without the need for uh, increased energy use. And again, you put financial assistance in place to make sure this kind of stuff happens effectively. What other things do we need to worry about? Now, national infrastructure is going to be problematic. If you have your climate changing in a pronounced way, you're going to see uh, disruption and degradation of your infrastructure increase. You know, this could be, you know, we could be talking about uh, disruption due to storms and stuff like that. We currently see that already. More storms, more disruption. It has an impact on the economy and on people's lives. Uh, or we could be talking about degradation through things like, you know, if you've got uh, particularly warm summers, you might see warping of railway lines. These are things that, that we need to consider, that we need to deal with. How do you deal with this? Well, you improve the infrastructure you have. You undergo a programme of replacing and improving infrastructure with climate change in mind. So you build new infrastructure that can cope with the demands that the climate is likely to throw at it over the, the, the medium to long term. Um, one big thing this gets talked about in the news reasonably frequently is implement and maintain systems for transferring water from areas of surplus, i.e. us in Scotland, to areas of deficit like East Anglia. So that if you do have areas where you're going to have pronounced water shortages during the summer months, you've got a mechanism to bring water to those areas. Uh, generally, this is, seems like an, an obvious one to throw in at this point, try and encourage your infrastructure, your you know your power generation to reduce its uh, reliance on greenhouse gas emissions. You know, make sure that you are using as much renewables as you can, you reduce fossil fuel usage. It seems really, really simple to say that, but it obviously is something we need to bear in mind is important. Um encourage in marrying into that the encouragement of local level energy production. You know, you will see people who have, as say, solar panels, mini wind turbines, things like that on their own property. You encourage that to make sure that people are not as reliant on the national grid and are not as reliant on more heavily polluting methods of creating energy. Um, to make sure all this stuff goes through, you put legislation in place, you make laws that are going to protect this infrastructure, and you focus your you focus your programmes on some of the systems that are going to be hit hardest first. So things like sewerage and flood drains. Increased precipitation will hit those systems hard early, so you need to enhance them quickly as well. And when you're doing all of this, we need to try and reduce our reliance on concrete and tarmac. We've talked a lot about how cements, concretes, etc. are very, very polluting things to create. And if we're talking about trying to reduce climate change, we need to reduce our reliance on those materials. Now, uh, I mentioned very, very briefly earlier in the video the idea of kind of economic risks and economic issues, but that is a serious one to consider. Now, large industrial areas, because they love to be built on flat land, are very, very commonly built on floodplains, and the clue is in the name. They flood. If you see increased rainwater, or increased precipitation, sorry, you're going to see increased flooding, which puts these areas at risk. Now, very many manufacturing processes, steel for instance, uh, are very, very reliant on having access to lots of water. And if water supplies become irregular, it's going to make manufacturing problematic. And also, 
tourism. Tourism is a major industry across the United Kingdom, across Scotland, and that is going to suffer if coastal areas are under threat, so that has to be protected as well. So how do we do this? You implement anti-flood measures. This is stuff we've kind of we've talked about previously before. You can look at things like the the Thames Barrier is an anti-flood measure. You can look at some of the stuff we mentioned earlier in the video. You try to do what you can to limit the extent of flooding that you're going to see. In order to make sure that small businesses can engage with this stuff as well, you're going to need to put grants in place to make sure that they can afford to put measures in place to protect themselves. Uh, if you've got businesses that aren't complying with rules and regulations, you put in place, you punish them, you increase tax on them, you fine them, you do things like that. Um, you introduce loans, and I've, I've mentioned this earlier, but if you've got people are willing to, to put in policies that will save water, you incentivize it. You give them loans and grants to make it easier to do it. Uh, you increase the price of water. You know, water is something that people pay for through rates, through tax, make it more expensive. If you make it more expensive, people will be less willing to waste it, which means there'll be more to go around. Now, as I mentioned, tourism is a very, very important um, economical uh, factor in lots and lots of places, so you need to protect it the same as any other industry. Final one on this point, um, you know, there are lots of very prominent historical areas in coastal regions, and the grim reality with a lot of that is, is you need to pick and choose what you're going to protect. So there has to be some areas where you record the historical significance of a site and then you abandon it and you let the, you know, if it's on a, if it's a, an old castle that's on a cliff that's ready to collapse, uh, you record the significance of it, you take as much evidence of it as you can, but if the cliff's going to collapse, you let the cliff collapse and the castle goes with it. If it's something that's more historically significant than that, then you maybe want to spend money to try and uh, preserve that area. Now, the last point, literally, water supply, and it's going to be the point we finish uh, we finish this video on. Yes, the UK is going to see increased rainfall as a rule. Uh, you know, we'll see increased levels of precipitation, which obviously means that water supply shouldn't be an issue. But these point, periods of increased precipitation will be interspersed with periods of drought, particularly in the southern UK. But we are talking about across the board here. So how do we deal with that? It's like stuff we've said earlier, you maintain water transfer programmes, you improve the infrastructure to reduce water loss through burst pipes and things like that. And this one, you know, in domestic settings particularly, you encourage people to implement low water use technologies. You know, most of you will have um, low low water flushes at home, you know, whether the two buttons on the flush in the toilet, and one of them is uses significantly less water than the other. Encourage people to shiver rather than take baths. All of these types of things are there to try to preserve the amount of water that we use. Now this is going to wrap up our, uh, our section three, guys, and until next time, I'll see you guys later.